Well, good afternoon and welcome. This is Mike Harris on RentsRadio.com, and today is Friday, May 3rd, 2013. And my guest today, long we've been waiting for since Wednesday, is Carrie Cassidy. Carrie, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. And let me first of all say profound apologies, because I got so wrapped up in the citizen hearing in Washington, D.C., I absolutely just went out of my mind completely, and uh, I really do apologize. That's really cruel and unusual punishment for a, a fellow radio, uh, <laughs> I don't know, DJ, whatever well, you, you know what? If, if, if that's the worst that happens, I'm having a good week, okay? So yeah, I, had a, I had a great show that day anyway, had a lot of really good callers. My listeners, you know, my, my, li- my listeners carried me that day. So I just got to thank them because cause they're, they're wonderful people and uh, I just love them. But anyway, uh, so really the reason I wanted you on the show uh, Wednesday was to give a live report from the, uh, the conference. You're back in California now and, and so the conference is still going on. So tell us what, what's happening. What, what's, uh, what's the real deal here? Well... <laughs> I'm actually getting some back channel uh, reports on what's going on live at the hearing right as we speak. Uh, And and just to clarify for everyone, so where you need to go, and it it looks like I might even be crashing their website, but let's let's say I don't crash their website because I I put out a a communique today that was absolutely uh, breaking news huge news and um and it should go viral very shortly and i've i've sent it on my newsletter as well as we speak so i i just tried to get back into the hearing website which is citizenhearing.org so that's that's uh c-i-t-i-z-e-n hearing.org uh and then you go to the webcast area and you can sign up for three dollars and eighty cents for the entire archive of the whole week's footage, uh, morning, noon, and night, and uh, very good stuff, excellent stuff, in fact. Uh, surprisingly so, because even I, as knowing all that I do, um, found that, th- that this was a very wealth worthwhile uh, enterprise, and I have to say that there were some witnesses uh, in, in sort of sporadically throughout the, the week uh, testifying for the first time live. And so that was, of course, for a person who does nothing but interview witnesses, um, for me that's very exciting because I I really think that the human library is is really with each individual. I think when all is said and done, when disclosure is is over and out there and so on and so forth, the historical record is going to be the memories of our, you know, armed forces, people in the military who were in the Black Plot projects and are in the Black projects, it is their recall that is going to be the best record we have because documents can be faked um, and so on. And history gets rewritten by the, as they say, uh, victors. Uh, and so it, this is a case where uh, this history is, is currently being rewritten live by the very people who have been, in a sense, the losers in all of this because they have had to keep secrecy uh, at the expense of their own um, sort of well-being at many times, their, their families, the safety of, uh, if they break those oaths, uh, then forfeiting uh, the safety of themselves, their loved ones and friends and family, oftentimes uh, certainly being subjected to all kinds of uh, heavy-duty surveillance, mind control, you name it. So in under those, um, I guess, uh, parameters, you can take a look at what's happening right now because this is very, very important what's going on now. And uh, let me see. I, first of all, before I go anywhere, I just want to say um, – that the there is breaking news right now, and it is I have put it out there on my website. So if you go to projectcamelotportal.com or projectcamelot.org or projectcamelot.tv, all three of those go to the same place, and scroll down to my blog front page. Right there is is on the front page. Um, you will find the links to to subscribing to this the live stream. It's it's of the hearing which is being concluded today. Uh, but t- this morning's testimony was absolutely groundbreaking because it was a video interview by Rich Dolan of a witness who was also interviewed for 90 hours in a very um, secret location uh, 14 years ago by Linda Moulton Howe and then buried 
under a threat uh, to the man's life. And I guess he has now died, and they are taking this time to release the, the interview. Uh, at least the 15 minutes interview from Rich Dolan, maybe that was an excerpt. Um, at any rate, it, that 15 minutes is absolutely, uh, it's disclosure in a nutshell. And this man, he is not being identified, but I'm sure when, you know, enough people see it, he will be recognized and we will get his name. There's no doubt about it. So um, probably everything else about him. So that will be quite fascinating. Uh, he even looks a bit familiar to me. I'm trying to place him in the sort of historical record, uh, but we'll see who who comes up with his name first. Um, but at any rate, if you want to listen to that, and, and, and not to me, because <laughs> you can't wait, I, I actually don't blame you and come back to this radio show and then, then you know, listen in because we'll, we'll have a lot more to talk about. But uh, 15 minutes is all it is. It, it, it starts out with some, you know, proceedings. It is labeled uh, May 3rd, Part 2. So it's, it's kind of confusing how they're labeling things, I have to say. looks like there's a, a, a Part A and a Part B and then a Part 2. I, I don't, you know, hopefully they're not going to change the labeling once I go out broadcasting this around um, so you can't find it again. But it is today's testimony this morning back east, and I am now in the West Coast. I just flew in last night. I was there for the... the for three full, full days, and then uh, I left yesterday to fly back here. Amazing how long it takes to, to fly from one coast to the other. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we had free energy, which it was heavily talked about today, I understand in the hearing, um, then, you know, we wouldn't be doing that. We would be getting from place to place uh, pretty much instantaneously, which is what our military is currently doing, our, our secret space program, that is. So... I have so much to say about this that I, I hope I'm not going to, you know, oh, I'm well, happy well, Carrie, Carrie, please, please <laughs> just go ahead. And if you if you want me to open up the, the listener lines, I can do that so we can take callers, sure. whatever you want to do today. Uh, we, well, we can do that. Um, let me just kind of get through this one part, and then uh, I'm happy to take questions as well because okay. that'll show me what the interest, you know, what the interest is out there on specific areas. And, I okay, the other thing that you need to do, the other piece of, of – homework that if you haven't done it already and you're listening to this show would be to go to the again to the front page of Camelot, Project Camelot Portal dot com, uh, Project Camelot dot org and Project Camelot dot TV. And also scroll down to my blog just a, a day or two, one or two uh, posts before today's post uh, of this incredible disclosure. Um, then you can also get the clips that I, I shot, some clips of actually the ex-Congress people who are on the panel, who are, who are receiving the hearing, that receiving the witness testimony in a live setting at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., you know, less than a block, as, as I understand it, from Congress and the White House. I'm literally right around the corner. I'm just amazing. Uh, so this groundbreaking, incredible event, uh, you know, is going on, um, and uh, who knew that it was going to contain such a, a concentration of great information, and I, I can describe really uh, the dramatic sort of uh, progression of, of events, but let me say that the witness testimony that came out today, this morning, with this gentleman for 15 minutes talking about Eisenhower and him basically sending uh, this man and another man out to tell the people at Area 51, who had taken basically the secret space program for all intents and purposes, who had taken over that area um, and were doing all kinds of black projects classified above the level of president because Eisenhower was the general he is or was, um, he wasn't going to stand by for that. So he basically told them, go out there, uh, give them a warning. If they do not show up in Washington... <laughs> I forget how many hours he gave them, you know, within a few hours or whatever, uh, that he was going to invade Area 51. He was going to get, he said the, I don't even understand the language, but something like the First Army, whatever. Um, yeah. It's like you've got a break. We, we, we have a break. We'll be right back, folks, more with Carrie Cassidy and her report from the, uh, the citizens' uh, hearings on UFOs. So we'll be right back right after this uh, break from our sponsors. Well, good afternoon. Welcome back. 
This is Mike Harris on RentsRadio.com, and today is Friday, May 3rd, 2013. My guest today, fresh from the uh, citizens' hearings on UFOs in Washington, D.C., is Carrie Cassidy. Carrie, welcome back to the show. Hi there. Uh, so where was I? Uh, right before the break, I was talking about Eisenhower sending in the troops to Area 51. I, I just get a, such a kick out of this. So uh, this is, in essence, what he, he threatened to do. And um, the reason was is that he was being told uh, that there was an alien being held underground at Area 51 and that um, they couldn't find out anything more because he didn't have a need to know because he didn't have the right clearances. So he basically blew his top and said, this is just not going to fly and uh, did what any good president should do uh, and ba basically um, uh, you know, threatened his own people, in essence. Uh, and, and so the, the, it's, this is really the beginning, uh, early days of the secret space program, and this is what I have been talking about forever. Um, and I think I'm one of the few people who really emphasizes this, this program because this is where the sort of all the money, all the power, all the technology you name it, is all residing in the secret space program, what in essence became a rogue, uh, basically in essence a rogue civ civilization, breakaway civilization within our own. And so uh, this, is, this is indeed the military industrial complex that Eisenhower, uh, with good reason apparently and experience, <laughs> warned us about. So, so that's what's disclosed by this individual who apparently was there was told by Eisenhower he was working uh, with another man. They were in the CIA, from what I, re I, I understand, although there's a, a lot more details we need to get. Um, but clearly this man is, uh, is, is, is very unwell when he's given the testimony, and he, apparently he died recently, if I understand it correctly. They are not releasing his name, as I said. Uh, but the testimony really stands on its own. And I have to say, Linda Moulton Howe, another very, very well-respected researcher, also interviewed this man. Her story is also on that same piece of footage that is, is in essence, the archive from earlier this morning, in which she gives live testimony right after the showing of this short excerpt, this 15 minutes with Rich Dolan. She actually talks about having how she went through 14 years ago in secret to interview this man, and then he was subsequently visited by two, two men in black and told not to uh, to be a loyal American and not to release that testimony and not to talk to Linda Moulton Howe again. By that time, she got 90 hours or something of, uh, of testimony, which apparently she buried all these years until now. So I guess this was a big bombshell. Uh, there was no previous notification that this was going to happen at the conference, but it did happen. And... Uh, and, and I basically, I, I mean, for all intents and purposes, as far as I'm concerned, this is kind of what you might say the coup de, coup de, coup de gras. <laughs> because, you know, they're, they're all week long, they've been hearing lots and lots of testimony. And the Congress people, the ex-Congress people, were getting, uh, Monday and Tuesday alone, they were already jumping on the bandwagon and already convinced that this thing had to be investigated, this thing had to be brought to a, to Congress in a hearing, et cetera, et cetera, that they were going to try to move this along. And then Wednesday, interesting shift on Wednesday. See, on, on Tuesday night, you kind of, uh, you got an on-the-spot um, series of clips from me where we were, we went onto the floor at the very end. The, the energy was, was dynamic. And people were um, were very uh, what, what what would you say? Uh, they were raw at that point. There were the Congress people that had been listening, the ex Congress people. Um, each one of them was being interviewed by by journalists who had been listening. So it was a madhouse. You've got a lot of background sound. It's right there in the room. The minute the thing ended but well, the, the, the impression that i had from watching your clips that you put up on your site carrie was that this was a lot of the environment was like you were live at one of the major political parties conventions there was that kind of energy to it yes uh there was always a buzz there there's a roar in the background you could, you could hear it and and people were were um 
They, they didn't know how to respond. I, I watched a couple of your, your comments that Senator Mike Gravel from Alaska. He didn't know what to say yes to and what to say no to. This guy's figuring this out on the fly. Well, I mean, you know, you have to understand that, that yes, that's true. Although I have to say that my questions, as, as people can appreciate who know Camelot, everyone was handled with kid gloves, okay? The testimony was very polite very formal. Uh, even Rich Dolan was holding back at one point uh, behind the scenes, actually went to him and said, please take the gloves off. This is crazy. Here's your opportunity. You know, tell it like it is. Stop mincing words. Uh, Stop beating and, uh, around the bush. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you know, when I ask a question, I ask it dead on. I, I don't I don't make nice. I don't kiss ass. I, you know, so and so forth. But these people are used are not used to that. They are clearly not used to that approach. And so, uh, you know, on at least on their behalf, I have to say that my approach was and my wording, they, they don't even understand. Like when you say, you know, are you familiar with Project Paperclip? Are you familiar with uh, interstellar travel? They, they don't even use that language. So that first their brain has to decipher what, what do those words mean? Uh, they, don't, they don't use secret space every day like I use it. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is where they had to translate before they answered me in their own minds what I was asking them. Yeah, right. I understand. We have a next break coming up, so stick with us, folks. We'll, we'll be right back in a couple minutes. More with Carrie Cassie right after this word from our sponsor. Stick with us, folks. Well, good afternoon. Welcome back. This is Mike Harris on RinseRadio.com. And today is Friday, May 3rd, 2013. My guest today is Carrie Cassidy, giving us an update from the uh, citizens' hearings in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club on UFOs. So, Carrie, welcome back. What what are some of the items? I mean, you, we, we've had a week's worth of testimony there from all sorts of, of military uh, personnel, uh, technical personnel from the scientific community. Uh, what what did we learn? What were the, the big blocks of knowledge that were disclosed? Uh, well, first of all, let me say this, uh, that initially what Stephen Bassett, I had him on my show for an interview prior to the actual event, just, just a few days prior, and he, he actually went out of his way to insist that, as he had told me behind the scenes weeks in advance, that this thing was going to concentrate on simply craft. In other words, whether UFOs were indeed real, a phenomenon, and should be investigated as to what they portended or, in, you know, or what they meant. Um, now, so the whole the whole emphasis was not going to be on the beings who drove the UFOs. It was only going to be on the UFOs. So, so it was all about craft. It was all about sightings. It was all about, uh, let's see, close encounters of the first and second kind, but not the third, supposedly. That supposedly later on at some point, Stephen Bassett was going to enter the whole area of abduction, contact. That was going to be a whole nother hearing. Uh, that he thought that was too much to bite off in one hearing. Now, as it happened, the people who were brought on the panel, who were ex-Congress people, to their credit, they, they first of all were given things to read and prep uh, for about a month in advance. So they were not coming to the panel completely blind. Uh, the other thing was that um, these people were interesting selections. In other words, if you go back into their ba their background as what they did in Congress, what they've done in their past, um, they were people that were particularly, I guess you might say, open-minded. Otherwise, they would never have come and done this, even if they are retired. Because this, is, again, was something, and they admitted that they were warned against. They had people telling them this is going to tarnish your image for going out and, and even listening to testimony about UFOs. So, well, so I'll, I'll, I'll disagree with that, Terry, because I think that would polish your image, because the American people want to know. We're tired of being uh, fibbed to. We're tired of the lies. We're tired of the, the BS. We're tired of the deception. I think that anybody who takes an honest look at this and, and openly embraces an investigation, you know, I think that would help their, their political career, not hinder it. Uh, you know, yeah, let me, let me just say this. Uh, you know, th this is interesting, because I have somebody who is trying to, to get to listen to me on the radio right now with you. And I agree. Rents's, uh, Rents's website, I'm sure he won't appreciate this, but I have to say it, it's almost impossible to find how to listen to you on the radio. Uh, 
it, it's he oh, said it's been well, a let me, let me let me give you give me some some help here and if, if you're listening right now or if he's on go to www.rinseradio.com and it'll take him straight to it you can click on live it'll take him just seconds uh, okay uh, I, why this isn't on the front page, uh, you know. Rents uh, Radio is a different site than Rents.com. And, and I agree they, that the sites should be uh, c- connected. They should be conjoined at the hips. Well, <laughs> connected is as an understatement. All we need is some, some clear radio icon uh, to, to indicate that you're, you're actually a way to listen to, their, to the radio show. Uh, uh, one would think that he would want to make that more available to people. But um, well, You know what? We, I'll, I'll talk to Jeff about that later today, and I will, I will point that out to him. I'll be glad to do that as, as a public service. Yeah, really. Yeah, I mean, th- you're not, this is not the first site where there, that's a dilemma. I, I actually have difficulty. A lot of sites where people say, well, I have a radio show, and then you go to their site, and you can't find it for the life of you. So uh, anyway, but to get back to the subject, the bottom line is that these people were were not totally unprepared, but they were eventually become, uh, in the course of of the, the at least three days that I was there, sort of like deer in the headlights. And certainly, when I got my interviews with them, a couple of them on the floor after the end of the second day, uh, they were really gun ho for the whole situation uh, and were on board because they'd heard testimony that convinced them that this thing was a reality. And the testimony covered, as I was saying, the craft themselves, the indications, except that the, their questions started going very far ranging. They wanted to know about the beings. They wanted to know about the implications. They, they were hearing, uh, eventually they heard uh, information about the shutdown of the Mano uh, air missiles um, and and so on and and what ha- what there became an elephant in the room in essence which is what I addressed in my my clips my short clips um, where I actually went up to them to ask them to talk about this more specifically because they were being very brave they were being very adventurous in their questions going far beyond the parameters that that initially. Uh, they were were set up by Stephen Bassett, who I think underestimated first the intelligence uh, of his 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 people there, but at the same time their willingness to kind of venture into this subject with both feet. Um, so so it really got into the technology. Stephen uh, Greer was there talking in depth uh, to to some degree of the technology. They saw his movie Sirius, which came, contains a lot about the technology. Um, they also had speakers after the live uh, hearing every day. Uh, speakers would speak, uh, give presentations for about an hour each uh, in more depth because when they were on the floor, they only were able to answer questions and give a 10-minute brief uh, summation of what they knew, which ended up to be quite substantial even so because every witness coming out one after the other after the other with unbelievable you know, basically proof for all intents and purposes, whether it be absolutely impeccable eyewitnesses. Police, we had police officers uh, documented from around the world uh, who had seen UFOs and reported them, and uh, military people from all countries. Uh, and, and so when you start getting this testimony backed up one after the other, after the other, after the other, the documentation and, and the sort of verification of the reality of this visitation and the fact that, as I said in my my clips, are they ours or are they theirs? In other words, human occupants or non-human? This is the question, and this ended up to be the biggest question, the elephant in the room. And then, that being the case, what, what began to happen was some of the Congress people began to sort of show their... Um, uh, colors, so to speak, in the sense that they started to show their leanings towards, oh, they're all friendly, or uh, the opposite, oh, we've got to investigate this because it could be a national security issue, not just national, but world, global. And then there started to be this weird tr- sort of tra- change or trajectory that instead of wanting to go to Congress, which is what they kind of ended up with at the end of Tuesday, I would actually say that they were possibly gotten to, maybe even as a result of my uh, clips 
uh, or whatever, or maybe it was okay, just... No, no, no. Now, uh, do you think they were gotten to, like, overnight uh, from one day to the next while at the conference? <laughs> Well, I think what, ha you know, obviously we're not the only ones watching this, right? So you've got, you're going to have, uh, in fact, I got back channel information from one whistleblower that told me there had been a meeting among uh, ex-presidents and certain other people warning them that if this disclosure thing got out of hand, how they're going to handle this. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I hear our next break coming up. <laughs> so when we get back, we'll have more with Kerry Cassie right after this word from our sponsors. Folks, stick with us. We'll be right back. This is Mike Harris on RentsRadio.com. My guest today is Kerry Cassidy, fresh from the uh, citizens' uh, hearings in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Cup. So, so Kerry, before we got cut off last time, we need to pick it up right back where we left off again. And so, really, these these people were gotten to, like, overnight. The men in black were there uh, that fast to, uh, to pressure Well, no, I, what I'm saying, I'm, I, look, I don't know for a fact. All I'm saying is there was a d distinct you know, when you sit and listen all day and all night, practically, uh, to testimony and to, you've got on stage, because I, I don't know if you've gone and seen how this, this is laid out. It's laid out like a Senate hearing in which these people, the, the Congress and ex-Congress people, uh, are up on a stage. They are literally under the bright lights um, from early in the morning until the whole thing um, ends around six at night. So you, you're sitting there, uh, you know, all those hours watching them, in essence, and watching the witnesses, listening to the testimony and listening to their response to the testimony. And so what happens is long about Wednesday, there was a distinct change in tone. This is all I can tell you. And the tone went from, yes, we need to go to Congress with this. Yes, the power resides here in this country. There was clear evidence that the United States had gone around to other countries and basically bought and paid for and bribed other countries for to be able to commandeer their UFO crashes. Okay, um, both get their the materials and take control of the crash sites. Um, and with that in mind, what it what it basically comes back to is who is running the scene here on planet Earth in terms of disclosure. And it all comes back to the United States, who is putting the stops on other countries from their disclosing any more than they have. And it was also very clearly uh, indicated that the files that are being released by other countries, such as Brazil and U the UK and, and a few others out there, those are simply your run-of-the-mill sightings type files. They are not government, you know, classified uh, sightings files, if you will. And so they're... And, and not only that, but the files they release, if there is anything classified, uh, they, they basically uh, white it out, black it out, and so the, file, the actual file itself may contain very little. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. Um, in other words, the secrecy, the culture of secrecy has been heavily in place. Now, what began to come out at the hearing was who should disclose this? Who should investigate this? What body should now pick up the ball? from this, which was a citizen's hearing, to actually take it from here and get real traction happening. Because the citizen's hearing acknowledged, to, you know, these are ex-Congress people. They don't have any pa real power. Uh, and, of course, the people at the hearing are, are all of the people that I, you know, uh, fellow uh, peers of mine and, and witnesses, right? So, so they don't have the power. In the end, uh, they were doing what they could, which is, is this, this incredible uh, event. But now the ball has to be picked up by some other body with s supposedly the power to absolutely uh, investigate this in depth and bring it forward. So that, the first choice, of course, was this Congress. That was where Stephen Bassett wanted it to go, and that is where uh, the plea was made, even at the very beginning of the conference or the, uh, this, the hearing. So what happened is it started to go that passed the buck to the United Nations. They started to say that, oh, the Congress people will never step up. 
They will never uh, allow this to, to come to a hearing uh, under their, you know, purview. They they basically won't uh, won't be able to handle it. Um, after the first day, there were some journalists, some mainstream journalists, who were again laughing at the, that proceedings. Uh, from what I understand, they were they were there were a couple uh, reviews read in which they questioned. Uh, made fun of, obviously never did their research and didn't know what the hell they were talking about, but nonetheless, they were actually insulting some of the ex-Congress people that were sitting there listening to testimony. It was just incredible. And so what happens is it began to change into, let's uh, know this should go to the UN. We need other countries to get involved, is what they were saying. But anyone who knows anything knows that this is going to go nowhere if it goes to the UN. First of all, the United States will not respond to pressure from the UN. That's just that's that's what this whole war is about. The war is to take down the United States and to uh, to put in its place a one-world government that will be then run by well whoever wins wins the fight, I guess. But in essence, the uh, the Rothschilds and and uh, and and the rest of them. So this is you 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 know it's it's basically a war within the cabal as to who is going to run this whole show. And the United States is still uh, run by a cabal and a secret space program that has taken the lead in many ways. It appears um, from all all evidence that that disclosure resides with the U.S. That the U.S. is the one keeping the lid down. And they will continue to do so. So if you go to the if you go to the UN, you're you're sort of passing the buck. And I, I actually talked to uh, Paul Hellyer, who is probably as I speak right now on the floor of the citizen hearing, talking about this exact thing. And and I got got an interview with him, and I'm going to be publishing it. And basically, he comes out and says this exact thing. He, he agrees with me. And as a person who has worked in government for many, many years, uh, he's, cert he's in an even better position than I to, to be able to, uh, to take a look at this situation and say, is going to the UN really the next step, or are they passing the buck? And in essence, he's saying, he is saying, he's agreeing with me that the next place this needs to go is Congress, that it is passing the buck to go anywhere else. And, uh, and he's coming out uh, today. He, he came out on, on the interview with me behind the scenes uh, yesterday, I think it was, whole, I, no, Wednesday night. But uh, that, that's the crux of the matter. So that's where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, as I like to say, the metal meets the road, and uh, and that's where we're going to get the real traction. Because Congress people, if Congress can't turn around to the executive branch and say, "Do something," we need this disclosure out there. Then we don't. Then what? It's kind of like the emperor's new clothes. The system is exposed for what it is—a sham. The secret government is running the whole the whole proceedings, and really, let me say that the Congress people listening to this these disclosures, what came out of this very clearly was that this fact that we are being run by a secret government that is making all its decisions completely independent of Congress and every other you know branch of the U.S. Uh, so-called government on the surface. Well, I agree, and I look at the. What we see is the is the surface government, the, the what we what I'll call the, the legitimate government versus the secret government. We have a lot of good people. Although the, the cabal has been very successful in infiltrating the uh, the legitimate government, and they're they're everywhere in it, we still have good people who are loyal Americans who want uh, to do the right thing. There's still a lot of good people in our government, and so I, I would encourage all of those good people to. Take the, the the step, take the risk, become a whistleblower yourself, and come out with this stuff, and and, and let this be known uh, to the rest of the world. Because the secret government is doing all they can do to keep this bottled up, to keep this secret, and they they will not survive the light of day. And so we have to shine the light of day on them to to really take apart the secret government, which I think is detrimental to life on this planet. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, so in essence, that's what we've got going on. And and and, the, but again, if you know, so witness the the change in tenors. So you said, were they gotten to? That's a good question. What I do know is that most of them did not make 
uh, many of the, uh, you know, the night after, after the adjournment, you can understand they're very exhausted, okay? And they're probably, from what I understand, they were having meetings among themselves during, during these hearings, uh, maybe to go over the day's events or whatever they were doing. And they didn't make it to those evening presentations all the time, okay? I guess sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Um, but I can tell you that the change in tenor from, again, the Tuesday night when I, I, I did that live uh, interview type thing, uh, to the Wednesday morning, there was repeated sort of en energy put in by the Congress people at that point, the ex-Congress people, to emphasize passing the buck, what I call passing the buck, passing it to the United Nations, passing it to uh, write to your Congress people, <laughs> passing it to, um, you know, in other words, trying to deal with the, the weight of the responsibility that was probably at that point just too heavy for them to bear, um, and which is, in a sense, it's understandable. I mean, really, we're talking about the, 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 the walls of secrecy being so intensely high, uh, brick after brick in the wall, um, that, that it's, it, it's daunting when you, when you look at that as to take that, uh, that wall down. Well, it's something that, that needs to happen, something that must happen. And I hear our music coming up in the background, people. After this uh, top of the hour, we'll be taking calls. The number is 877-342-6673. And, Carrie, this is our longer break at the top of the hour news. So if you need to take a break or anything, uh, now is a good time, okay? Be right back, folks. More with Carrie Cassidy. Well, good afternoon and welcome back. This is Mike Harris on RentsRadio.com, and today is Friday, May 3rd, 2013. My guest today is Carrie Cassidy, fresh from the uh, Citizens' uh, uh, Disclosure uh, hearings in, uh, in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. And, and Carrie, do you have any other issues that you want to give an overview of before we start taking callers? Um, I, I'm actually trying to review that at the moment. I... Not that I can think of, I mean, things may come to mind as we proceed, uh, you know, with callers and so on, or, or as... as you know, the, the thing, thing that I'm most uh, interested in is, is what new disclosure has, has, has happened as a result of this. What new things have we found out? And then uh, conversely to that is what things that were verified, that were rumored before, we now have more confirmation on. And that's open-ended. I'll, I'll let that lie for now. But let me give out the dial-in number one more time. It's 877 Three four two six six seven three and people we welcome your calls. The number is eight seven seven three four two six six seven three. And let's go ahead with uh, Ryan from Washington. Ryan, welcome to the show. Good afternoon. Yeah, you know the the problem that we have in this field is there's so much there's so much so much nonsense. There's so many there's so many charlatans and 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 hoaxes and made up. Uh, the phenomenon is real, and, and most of the people at this thing today were. Uh, Incredible, but the problem we have is there's so, there's so there's so much nonsense uh, that most of it's purposely put out there to to spoil the research that the people that have spent 30 years investigating this scientifically have done. You have people that uh, there's certain reasons why people uh, are out there, uh, you know, to sell books, or uh, they just it, it's an ego thing where they want to be the center of attention. Or they just love putting a kick on everybody, like like they, like this Benjamin Fulford guy. I mean, this guy loves to put to spend everybody in circles. He loves he loves seeing. Um, uh, well, let me hi caller. Uh, I assume you call. Has me anything that Bender, Benjamin Fulford ever said ever come true? I mean, everything that he said, it, it seems like, and now now all of a sudden he doesn't want to talk about it. And, oh, and well, this Ryan, is the kind Ryan, of Ryan, that we need to get. Ryan. You're, you're, you're yeah. not here. You don't, you don't have the floor to proselytize here yeah, or preach. You've got the floor to ask a question. Do you have a question for Kerry? Well, um, no, I don't really have a question. I just uh, one question I would have uh, for Kerry is that because you know, like these uh, witnesses uh, there today and this week were probably some of the better, more credible ones that we've had. But the question for Kerry would be. Uh, when you invested, uh, investigated um, the Sherpa case, uh, you and Bill Ryan um, it were, it said that you were on track with one of the people that you thought might have been involved and that you actually approached their house or approached their living quarters, and that person probably is dead and gone now. 
but can you can you tell us a little bit more about who this per, one of the people was that you think might have been involved in that? And I'm not I'm not bashing you, Carrie. I'm just saying the entire field in general. I'm not talking well, about you. Well, um, you know, I, look, I appreciate your call. Um, let me just say that uh, yes, that that man we did go to his house. He was prepared for us. They did. Uh, uh, bug our car and he and his wife were literally standing at the front door as we drove up um, and she came out to, to get our letter which we delivered a letter because we didn't want to over intimidate the man by you know when we when knocked on the door uh, we wanted to give him some time to make a decision as to whether to talk to us uh, for all intents and purposes we believe that that was a uh, one of the directors of the program the SERPO program uh, I forget his exact title but at any rate um, it's it's been many years since that happened uh, and and that's not at all this this discussion we're having here but I, I will say that um, there's no doubt whatsoever that this man was an ex-military individual uh, he did refuse to talk to us um, we did go in person, and uh, and and as I say, we were we were followed and we were bugged. So, um, you know, take it for what it's worth. The other thing is that, uh, you know, what one person has said to me, which I think is is very valid. Look, if if just one of those craft is real, if just one of those craft and one of the beings is real, one. One witness testimony is real and valid, and one piece of wreckage is valid. Then it changes the entire paradigm of the entire what's going on here on the planet and what you've been told since you were, you know, um, born. So, so it doesn't need, uh, you know, hours and hours of witness testimony. The fact that we've got that is just extra verification for those that are now completely bought into the matrix, which is when I say matrix, a bunch of lies. So this is, well, well, this is okay. what you're looking at. Let, let me make a point here. And the point is that if 90% of all the stuff out there is hokum, who cares? That means that 10% is real. <laughs> I mean, well, that's just another way of saying what I just said. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yes, yeah, it is. Down to, to one, literally one craft. If one craft makes it here from, uh, from outside the solar system, or if for some reason our, our military is flying around using free energy, creating flying saucers, and there are no ETs, they just got it, let's say, from, from uh, their good imagination, and they, they got it, you know, many years ago, um, and they're overflying their own missiles, and they're turning their own missiles off, and, uh, and, and dismantling them, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. countless military people have come forward as witnesses, and you just have a deathbed confession of a military man, uh, uh, you know, basically what you've got is, all I can say is, look, the truth is out there. Uh, if you don't want to believe it or you, you, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's too much for you, what you're doing is it's better. It's a case that has been made better than most uh, murder trials that you will ever see in your lifetime. And it's, it's not. Um, so, yes, there is this info. Who would deny it? You know, what happens is you have a culture of secrecy that doesn't want you to know the truth. So in spite of that, this is the amazing thing. We have airtight testimonies, one after the other after the other, with multiple witnesses, multiple. Um, and, and we've got craft, and we've got, I've held in my hand some of, the, some of this material, by the way, um, from one of the witnesses. I mean, look... <laughs> How do you explain it? It's it's all there. Uh, the citizen hearing turns out to be five very intense days. Um, it's laid out there very nicely and very uh, with with a great kind of question answer from people who are not read in, who don't in theory know really their sort of way out of a paper box when it comes to uh, disclosure, and they are being educated in the process. Watch their reaction reactions watch the questions they ask follow the trail uh you know it all i can say is um yeah the truth is out there well carrie let me ask you a question because i think this will set up for the listeners to understand what's really at stake and i want you to answer this and that is if the the shadow government uh, the secret space program if the genie gets out of the bottle if this notion that we we do have these technologies and that we have been in touch with other alien et races what's at stake for them what what happens to the world as we know it if this information gets out to the general public 
And, and so I, I want the I want the listeners to understand why the shadow government is fighting so hard to keep this away from us. Well, I mean, look. In the end, what they addressed at this particular hearing was not the wise, okay? That's kind of the next step. That's where the mind goes when you receive all this testimony. So you're kind of leaping ahead of the bus, so to speak, and I can certainly address it because I've, I've gone way ahead of the, uh, the, the, the mainstream and the even, even – I would, I would venture to say that, you know, Stephen Bassett, would not let me testify, and my witnesses for the most part, because we go way outside even the box that, 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 that disclosure contains. In other words, we are so far ahead of the curve, they just can't even begin to go there yet, which is why my questions to those uh, ex-Congress people on the clips that I've published so far, and you're going to see more when I get them out there, um, it, it's why they became sort of so... So uh, sort of dazed and confused, they've, they've never been approached so directly, and they weren't even considering the ramifications fully when they were getting the testimony. But that's what is the next step. The next step is, first of all, you find out, are, they, is it, are those craft in the sky ours or theirs? meaning human or non-human. And then once you decide that, you have to decide the implications of that. Okay, well, Carrie, I, I want to hold our spot right here. At if they're human or non-human, we'll come back and revisit this right after the short break from our sponsors. Stick with us, folks. Once again, the dial-in number is 877-342-6673. like to hear from you. This is Mike Harris on RinseRadio.com. Today is Friday, May 3rd, 2013. My guest today is Carrie Cassidy. And Carrie, before the break, we were talking about things that are seen in the sky, craft that are seen. Are they ours or are they theirs? And, you know, the implications, if they're ours, means that we have uh, science and technology that has not been disclosed to the public. And if they're theirs, it means that uh, we're not alone in the universe, and they have superior technology than what we have because they can go to uh, other solar systems, and we have not yet publicly dis displayed that, that ability. Yes, well, this is, uh, you know, I have to say on a certain level, this is kind of interesting to me. Um, Camelot it plays a very interesting role, Project Camelot, what I'm part of. And uh, I have to say that people who have gotten into this whole sector and done a lot of investigation, et cetera, et cetera, very few times do they actually visit the implications overall, the, what we call the big picture. In other words, once you have the big picture, once you go be, be, beyond the matrix and you start to paint, fill it in, paint in, you know, all the dots, then you begin to see a picture of something. It begins to describe itself, so to speak. And that's where you get into a whole different ball game, because that's where people have to actually be discerning. They have to actually be able to add 2 plus 2 and not get, you know, 600, uh, etc. And so what happens is you also need to be able to intuit and interpret. I mean, it's a very different task. And it's something that I've been doing for years um, at the objections of, of many other people sometimes. But I, I think it's going to be well, sort of well-earned stripes in this particular area. Because what's going to be required is that leap to where you go, just as, as I showed you very briefly with the Congress people. The minute I start to take them out of the area of just looking at the evidence into what does the evidence mean, this is where they get frightened because the implications are earth-changing, okay, earth-shaking even. And so what happens is, look, as I said, as I questioned um, Mike Rebell and, uh, and, and um, gosh, his name is just going out of my mind, the other congressperson, um, in essence, if you overflow our missile silos and you turn off the technology, are you a friend or a foe? On the one hand, the, the new agey pe people would like to say, because a lot of the greys have come down and they put mind control into the, to the minds, and this is my version, of, of, of the contactees, and they basically said, oh, save the earth, get it, you know, bring the earth back into fruition. And I always said to them, save the earth for who? You see, nobody goes to that next step. Why do they want to save the earth? You think they're saving it for us? No. 
Uh, not in the case of the service to self grays. Uh, now there are plenty of grays that are other species, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But keep in mind, who turned off the misosilos? What was their intention? First of all, it's an act of power. Okay, power over. Okay, and so at a certain point you have to look at that and you have to say, okay, are they really nice guys? Is there not an implied threat there? It certainly is saying our technology is beyond yours. That was in the 60s. This is where it's an interesting dichotomy, but what happens is we have to come to the secret space program now. And where are they at? Because look, if they found this out and you were in the military in the 60s or the 50s or the 40s even, where there is good evidence of, then at some point you have to ask yourself, are they friendly or are they not? And you cannot make an assumption when there's hundreds of thousands even of different races and those hundreds of races at the very least are visiting here. Then you cannot, what are their agendas? You must begin to decipher those questions. And you can't just sit there and go, oh, you know, um, uh, you know, la-di-da, they're all friendly. No, I don't think so. Uh, I wasn't there to yesterday, but I understand that, that the, uh, the, the Latin, the Latino, uh, the, the people from South America were testifying. And they were testifying to people being abducted and killed. And look, Linda Moulton Howe did a very uh, good Ex, you know, sort of um, talk on the the uh, the cattle mutilations. But what people don't realize when they're looking at those mutilated cattle with no blood, that we're talking about a species that drinks blood. Hello, okay. <laughs> Some group out there. Oh, no, I know. I, I get blood. it. <laughs> <laughs> they drink blood and fluids. Okay, they're not just there to, as geneticists. Okay, that's just one of the things they're doing. And these are the things that, you know, became obvious in, in, in Dulcie and the revelations from witnesses regarding Dulcie, etc. The, 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 this is the kind of testimony they didn't even want to touch in, in the hearing this week. Okay, but there are ramifications. Okay, they, first they turn off our missile silos, then they kill our cattle, then the blood is gone, uh, the, the, the organs are gone, and they don't just do it once in a while, they do it all the time. If you're doing a genetic uh, experiment, you just need one piece of DNA. You don't need to come back and kill cattle over and over again. So something well, and, else is going yeah. on. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right about that. And you know, uh, according to to Duff, who who says he has had access to the uh, um, the Majestic Twelve files, he says that there there's very horrific things in there and very horrific species that we're going to have to deal with and encounter. But before we go much further, let's give out the dial-in number again at eight seven seven three four two six six seven three. And after this short break, we'll be back with Mark from Philadelphia. This is Mike Harris on RinseRadio.com. Today is Friday, May 3rd, 2013, and my guest today is Carrie Cassidy. So if anyone has any questions or comments for Carrie, the dial-in number is 877-342-6673. And let's go ahead and welcome uh, Mark from Philadelphia. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Hello, hello, Mike, and hello, hello Carrie. Uh, Mike, you keep, you keep outdoing yourself. I'm on the edge of my seat here. It's so fascinating to, to, ha to have Carrie and uh, to be able to even have a chance to ask her a question or two. Uh, Carrie, I, I, when you were on the show previously, on Mike's show, I, I listened to what you said, and you told us about a couple of shows, the, the, uh, the event and Fringe, and I'm not a television person, but I, I went and I checked it out, and I, I found it on Netflix, and I, and I watched the, the event, and I'm in, currently watching Fringe. I'm in the third season, almost through the third season, and what I'd like to ask you is, can you give us some details? Because you said there there are some details in those shows that are actually valid, and they're 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 real. They have a real connection to what's really going on. Could you could you let us know what those are? <laughs> well, th there's a great deal uh, that that is that is true about our reality that is put into those TV shows, and there's also some. Um, I guess you might call it foreshadowing of possible events that will also come down here on this planet. At least that's what I'm hearing. Um, until they do, of course, we won't know for sure. But this is what movies have been doing over over the last uh, few years and many years. And so uh, no, no uh, reason to think they're going to change 
pace now. Uh, television, of course, has been doing the same thing. So what you have in Fringe, for example, is time travel in which you've got, uh, in essence, uh, a black project scientist who is who has created a way to cross over to the parallel universe and go and uh, and get the son that died in this universe and bring him back over uh, and and bring him up in this in this universe. Okay, so in essence, is that possible? And I have a recent whistleblower, in fact, uh, that I talk about at the very end of my time travel conference that says just that. It is eerily uh, similar his testimony to what is seems to be going on with our, our black projects. In other words, that that capability is, is very real. Um, now, can we prove it? Can I prove it? Uh, no, not at the present time. I can simply say, watch that. The things that are depicted there are, are very close to, uh, to things going on in the real hidden world of the military industrial complex, but the hidden side of it. And, uh, and they love to seed movies and TV with the truth. And it's part of the Illuminati sort of um, parameters in which they exist. They, this is what they must do. They actually must do uh, on a karmic level to get away with it all. This is how they think they pay off their, if you want to call it karma, or something else. This is how they, they pay the piper and also uh, gain traction because energetically they can, uh, they can use the, the energy when it starts to focus in a certain direction, especially if it's, if it's uh, naive. But at any rate, um, so that's the fringe side. The event... Uh, I am told that there is a group of beings that are here that have made a deal with uh, governments, and I, I've talked about this. So if you haven't already seen my blog and you haven't seen uh, what I've been releasing there, I do talk about this in depth. You can see blog articles in which I address this. Um, offhand, I forget the name of the most recent ones where I talk about this, but in essence, there seems to be evidence uh, not just from one whistleblower, but from a several that is coming in saying that Africa is being uh, traded off to an incoming group of beings who are humanoid. In other words, they look human, um, whose planet has been destroyed, just like the storyline in the event, and that they're trying to soften the blow for the populace by putting out the show called The Event, which, by the way, is still available for free I believe, on NBC last time I looked, uh, which I think is who released it, um, and if memory serves. And uh, the thing is that, so what you have is the seeding of the information by way of a fic so-called fictional sci-fi uh, TV show, what is in essence something very real. The governments are aware of this, that uh, some of them are on board with it, some aren't, that uh, they're already arriving, that they're here now, uh, some of them, and uh, Africa will be the last to know, uh, it, although some people certainly in the intelligence field, if you want to call it that, um, might be an oxymoron but to call it that. But at any rate, that field are aware of this. Uh, the question is, if they're going to do that, what do they do with the rest of the beings, especially if there's two billion of them, which is what was seeded into the event TV show. Uh, if, if indeed that was really true, and these are benign beings, but they just need a planet, their trade-off with the uh, space on a planet, their trade-off supposedly with the secret government is that they're giving them uh, access to terraform other planets somehow, whether it be because they, they give us special coordinates in which to find those planets, or whether they actually give us advanced technology that we don't already have, to use jump gates or whatever you want to call to get to those planets or in other words I don't know what the exact trade-off is I know there's a trade-off uh, it may not be a trade-off that includes you and I it may only include those people that they can take off planet at a certain juncture um, they plan long term so all of this is is very interesting now whether it's going to happen whether it will be protected whether you know the ETs will step in and not allow it whether we will get wise and not allow it, all of these are, are sort of um, questions. Well, I, have, I appreciate that very much. I have another question for you. On the, the event, which I found fascinating and which I had, I had intuitively 
felt something going on with this whole idea of us having uh, nuclear reactors on planet Earth. And what's interesting in one of the one of the, a couple of the episodes in the event, the uh, the characters basically refer to the idea that they're going to seed the technology of, of our Earth because they need to ramp up their technologies in order to get try to get back home. So they seeded our technology with this stuff called uh, nuclear fission. So did 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 uh, in your from your pers- perspective did the aliens uh, bring nuclear fission idea to planet Earth and and promulgate it across the planet and also is this part of a design to take us down and and where in, where in fact they may have the technology or the ability to either neutralize it or actually they may thrive on nuclear nuclear uh, radiation I don't know could you have any input on that um, you know the nuclear question is is very interesting and yes that I mean you're 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 right that they that was part of the storyline of the event uh, interestingly enough though it, you see how the tables turn well maybe you're not that far along in this the event or maybe you saw the whole thing but basically what oh, ultimately the whole thing. happens okay fine then you know that ultimately um, seeding that technology in order to then go home with it didn't work so maybe that was even a cover story to begin with it's not said that way in the event but if you can extrapolate that in other words yes it's possible that we we did get nuclear um, sort of the technology uh, from visiting races we do know that the Nazis got a tremendous amount of information and that they were very instrumental in the building of the atom bomb for example their technology and that most of their technology seemed to come from off-planet but however you get the technology right now I'm reading Isaac Asimov and I guess we have a break so I well we we, we have a break so stick with us we'll be right back Um, more with Carrie Cassidy right after this short break from our sponsors be right back it's Mike Harris on RinseRadio.com and today is Friday May 3rd 2013 my guest today is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, and we're on with caller Mark from Philadelphia. Mark, I'll give you one more minute because I got to move on. I have another caller I want to get to. So, uh, sure, what sure. else? What else is on your mind? So, well, sure, no problem. The other thing on, about the event, uh, Carrie, is that what's interesting is I came up to this. I came up uh, away with this, and so did Mike because he commented on the show the other day, and I came away when they destroyed the Washington Monument. When I was watching that in the event, I was like, right after that, I was like, going, could they have used that same that same device, that same kind of device to, to do that boom that they did in, in uh, Virginia that happened, which, by the way, I felt here in Philadelphia. I wondered about that, and I'm, I'm like, uh, that's one question I have. And the other thing I'd like to say is, is any, my whole thing about the radiation thing is who in their right mind would put nuclear fission on this planet anywhere, especially putting it in the uh, – the, the, the fire triangle, or whatever you call it, over there in Japan. I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. And I'll let it go with that. Thank you very much, Mike. And please, uh, thank you so much, Carrie, for the great work you do. We, I love to, ex- to learn all that you are exposing. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the questions. Uh, yeah, you mean the ring of fire, I, I understand. Uh, well, I it's almost like they're following a script. This is what I have to say. Uh, and in some ways, they really are. Uh, you can imagine if you have Cray computers, it, there seems to be an AI at this point. If you listen to my time travel conference that just completed a couple weeks ago, you would have heard from Preston Nichols, who was one of the Montauk scientists. And he is now, he believes he's in communication with the AI. Um, he calls him Tabor, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, wild stuff. But really, this was a stellar well, conference. You know, you, know, you, know who, you know who Tobor is, don't you? Uh, well, I know there's a – go ahead and tell me. It's, it's, well, it's well, Tobor was, was from a, a 1960s a Japanese ca- cartoon called Tobor the Eighth Man, who – Tobor is, ba- is robot backwards. I see. Okay, fine. So at any rate, this is what he – but he, he's, he's a scientist, so he's coming at this from a different direction, and that's what he calls him. But at any rate – all I'm saying is that people can subscribe or not subscribe, but buy the stream, which is dirt cheap. It's it's five dollars a speaker, um, and and I encourage you to do so because that was also a stellar conference. Uh, in answer to the question about nuclear energy, let me say this: uh, I was about to say right before the break that Isaac Asimov, in the Foundation, talks about uh, you know the sci-fi writers seem to have some of them, like Arthur C. Clarke, seem to have been read in 
to things in the secret um, the space program that others were not, and they seeded these into their novels. And so, one thing that he talks about in this in this novel is uh, is is nuclear energy and how that makes a distinction between uh, sort of a people that is ripe for invasion. From what I got from him, and that they have to be at that certain juncture before other races, you know, that are beyond them in, in technology, etc., will even bother with them. And then once that happens, that that's a juncture. And I, I have to say that we, I believe, intuitively, as an intuitive, that we have not gotten to um, know what nuclear uh, fission, what that's really all about. In other words, what we've been told, how we're using the power now, I think is still at some kind of remedial stage. And I believe there's some clues in uh, these these recent things like the event to where it's it becomes a reference point or a jumping off point. And I think there's more there than meets the eye, and I think that it hasn't been revealed. What it is, what it's really capable of, I don't know. But I do know that the sort of built-in obsolescence of our nuclear power plants that are right now uh, basically becoming obsolete and, 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 you know, melting down as we go through the earth changes, uh, and just over the years of, of disuse or whatever you want to call that misuse, um, this is built into the model. And that's with a purpose in mind. In other words, radiation has, its, has some kind of um, significance to moving into the fourth dimension. And it also has significance if you listen to this Aradia couple that I inter interviewed from Russia who, uh, one of whom was born in Chernobyl, uh, apparently, or thinks she was. And they basically use radiation as food. And there's something very significant about moving to become a light being and, uh, and, and, and changing the dimensional, uh, the levels of dimensions or density that you are as a human and as we are as a planet, that is, is there's a key in radiation. That's all I'm saying, and I think it, it's worth investigation. Okay, well, we've got a caller, Travis, from California. Let's welcome him to the show. Travis, good afternoon. How are you, sir? Hey, good afternoon, guys. I wanted to, first of all, I wanted to thank you both for, for your service to humanity. You guys are doing a fantastic job, and I know it's, it's got to be pretty rough out there, so I want to thank you on behalf of all of us. Uh, question for Carrie, and I think there's two really questions I, I, I really would like answers because I'm curious. There's something that people go around talking about this prime directive, this so-called Star Trek prime directive. And my question is, based on my research, it seems like we've been messed with for a long, long, long time. Well, if that's the case, you would think the others, the others who have the prime directive would so, sort of be like, well, if they got messed with by this group, then we're allowed to do certain things because they were already messed with. That's one part of my question. The second part is... And I know you talk about, you know, the bad guys, the bad aliens are, you know, looking at these guys. My question is, how do we know what sort of bad they are? Meaning, in other words, these guys are coming, they're getting shot down by our military. Are they an enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of bad, or are they bad for humanity? In other words, are they against the cabal, or are they against humanity? And I guess it's just, I, I'm just kind of curious about that. I'll, I'll take your response. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you, Travis. Have a good day. Uh, well, thank you for the questions. I, uh, well, I, I'm i not sure that, that went the way the first one was phrased. Uh, maybe, Mike, you, you understand it better. Uh, I, I'm not sure what you were asking uh, for me, from me uh, in, in terms of the first question. Well, I, I just think he was looking to, to hear... You know, why are people within this cabal even dealing with these people who may have humanity's best interests is not, not at their heart? That, that's how I took it. Okay, but that sounded like the second question. Okay. Uh, so I was just trying to, I, I'm, I'm very sorry, I, I apologize, but the second question seems to have, have taken precedence. So let me go there first, and then you, you could call back and clarify, or maybe you could send a, yeah, a yeah, Skype. Yeah, Travis, feel, feel free to call back or send a Skype message, whatever. 
Uh, yeah, and just clarify that first question. Uh, but the second question, um, basically, you're you're just describing the playing field a little bit more. All I'm saying is that we have both what are called service to self and service to others, alien or or, or visitors, uh, some of whom are 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 really intimate to dimensionals apparently. Um, and and you want to describe what their agendas are and whether they're working for us or against us or for the cabal or against the cabal and actually it's that it's that mixed up I mean uh, the, the bottom line and this is what people don't realize and and I was hoping would maybe start to come out but I was kind of wishful thinking at the hearing uh, which is in essence that various militaries believe it or not are actually working with factions of different alien races that don't even get along so what you've got is you've got the Army working with one group, you've got the Navy working with another group, you've got the Air Force working with another group, um, and you've got the Russians dealing with one group, you've got the Chinese dealing with another group, and it, so it goes. And then you've got, you know, the Greys who are uh, basically here uh, having made deals with Eisenhower and so on in exchange for being able to abduct and, and start their genetic program here on Earth, which is now a huge success, and they, they've moved on uh, and and are doing other things as well, I imagine. And, uh, <laughs> you know, this is why it's so complex. If, if it was just black and white or simple good guy, bad guy, it, it would be, be more simple. But it's not like that at all. In other words, yes, my the enemy of my enemy could be my friend from time to time. But on the other hand, he might not always be my friend. And, and I think that, um, in other words, it's, it's a complex uh, question as what it is living here on Earth determining whether, for example, if you're in politics here on Earth, you wonder, and, and the analogy is a good one, really, uh, it, you wonder if France is the friend of the U.S., and if they're the friend of the U.S., are they the friend of the American people? Or, on the contrary, are they actually just friendly with the Kapal within the U.S., and are they working for their own ends? And is it the whole French government? Is it the secret government, the surface government? Who are the players? Are, do the players have various agendas? This goes for the Russians, for the Chinese. In other words, the complexity of political relationships here on Earth is a microcosm to the macrocosm that we are now entering as galactic citizens for all intents and purposes. In other words, it's the same type of playing field. You have beings, some of whom even have individuals within their, uh, assuming they're not a group mind, which many are hive mind, but, but if they're not a group mind, you could even have it in individuals that could be less threatening to us as individuals than perhaps the group agenda is. Or they can just be pushing a group agenda that they don't even necessarily believe in. And, in fact, I've heard of, that there are even rogue groups of greys who broke away from the initial group of greys at some point during their trajectory because they no longer wanted to abduct humans against their will and eat them and steal their children and so on and so forth. Well, Carrie, like they say, as above, as below. And so yes. um, what, what we're doing on here is, is what they're doing up there. And it looks like we're out of time again. I want to thank you so much for, uh, for making it. Really, really love having you on. You're just a great guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, and have a great day, everybody. Have a nice weekend. I'll be back next Monday. Everybody take care. Bye-bye.